Working Cows Podcast, episode 248. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Conry, host of the Working Cows podcast, powered by the Global Ag Network. Very excited to be joined today by Sam Newell. Sam is a, Sam is a ranch manager in Florida and uh, really looking forward to chatting with him. Uh, this was facilitated by Luke Perman. And if you've been a listener of the Working Cows podcast, you know uh, Luke's guest recommendations are pretty highly regarded around here and uh, really have enjoyed a chance that I've had to get to rub shoulders with Luke at a, a couple of different events uh, recently. And and um, he's just a real, real strong guy in this field and, and really appreciate his perspective. And so when he says, uh, this is a guy you should talk to, I, I tend to listen pretty closely. And uh, he said that I should talk to Sam specifically as a young guy who is uh, headed in a really positive direction in this industry and specifically as a young guy who has a really good head on his shoulders as far as managing people. And so I decided, hey, let's talk to Sam today about what he uh, has learned as far as managing people is concerned and what um, resources he has found really helpful in that journey of managing people, especially as somebody who's managing them as a younger guy, uh, maybe managing people who are older than himself and some of the resources that he's found useful in that regard. So Sam, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Clay. I'm happy to have you on here today to talk a little bit about uh, managing uh, on the people side. Um uh, of the business, you know, we talk about those four pillars of a ranch operation: uh, the the people, the cows, the land, and the the economics and the finances. So uh, today, again, getting to focus on on the people side of things. Uh, how have you? How has your management of people uh, kind of developed over time? What have been some of the different roles that you've had? the opportunity to play that have given you uh, the opportunity to uh, sharpen that management axe, as we like to say around here on the Working Cows podcast, um, as it relates to people management specifically. Okay. Yeah, no. So um, I kind of started my uh, career in ranching um, by working in a a ranch in uh, northern Utah, northeastern Utah. Um, And just being able to I've kind of worked all over, um, just as kind of moving in and out of, uh, summer jobs going to college. And so that's enabled me to see a lot of different management styles working on different branches, like seeing Luke Perman's management style and Lyle Perman, his father, uh, you know, just seeing how they kind of manage people, how they manage cows, how they manage grass. And so I've, I've had the opportunity to see a lot of, um, different management styles of people. And so when I I was able to uh, kind of take the role as manager after being a cowboy and seeing all the different styles, um, you know, I was able to kind of pick and choose and work through uh, what I liked, what I didn't like. Um, And uh, so my first year was pretty rough um, as I'm sure it is for a lot of young managers, Um, just trying to learn myself learn how I want to manage on top of, um, you know, the, all the production side. So, you know, you're managing employees on top of managing production. Um, and so I, I was lucky enough to have some great, uh, managers that were, um, helping me through and, uh, you know, just great role models for me, um, just being a young manager and, uh, they're just kind of helping me work through some of those things. Um, it wasn't until I had a, a, a paradigm shift is what I'm going to call it. Um, you know, of, um, where I was moving in a certain direction, but I had a shift and, uh, kind of changed my mindset, changed how I wanted to go about things. Um, and it was, I, I had, uh, I had broken my foot in an, uh, not a very fun circumstance. Um, but it was breaking that foot and, um, being in a tractor instead of being horseback. Um, it allowed me to, 
Um, I first started out by just listening to music for the first couple of days and the music just uh, didn't give me anything, right? Like kind of just set you in that stagnant mindset. You just kind of sit there and just get through your day. Um, but I had, I had, uh, one of my friends tell me, reach out to me and like, Hey, you should check out this book. So I started reading a book and I loved reading the book in the tractor and I ended up just pounding out books. I was in the tractor for quite a while. So I was able to read a lot of books, um, and po- read, listen to some podcasts. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of started this, this mindset of, um, to continual learning, right? Like I, I wanted to just continually improve myself. I'd always wanted to do that. I just didn't really quite know the right routes to do that. And the, the, uh, different resources available to me. So that kind of started the, the uh, continual learning mindset, I'll call it. Yeah. What was the book? What was the book that you listened to first or was it even related to people management? <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't related to people management. It was actually rich dad, poor dad, mm. uh, which is a very highly recommended book. I love that book. It was great. Uh, such a great uh, introduction into um, books of like self-improvement and fan- financial improvement kind of books. Um, so yeah, it didn't relate to people management, but it kind of started the track, got me on the track. So, yeah. And that that's rich dad, poor dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Uh, I would be surprised if it isn't in the resources page at working cows.net slash resources, but, uh, yep, it's there. So <laughs> you could, you can find that and find a copy of that and, uh, look that up for yourself and, and take it in if you haven't already. But, um, then, so, so were you, the tractor work, was it, was it farming? I mean, you were planting crops yeah. and, and that kind of stuff. Yes, sir. I was, uh, I was on mower. Just gotcha. mowing. Putting up some hay. <laughs> yes, sir. Gotcha. Yeah. And then, the, so what was the, so the paradigm shift was actually the paradigm shift towards lifelong learning. Is that right? Yes, sir. That is correct. Yep. yep. And so did you go yeah. to college in Utah? You said that you worked on some ranches in Utah. Did you go to college there? I did. I went, I uh, graduated from Utah State University, um, but I took some breaks. I worked in Nebraska in the Sand Hills. My wife and I, we went and worked there uh, for about a year, year and a half. Um, I worked in uh, South Dakota with Luke in a while. Uh, worked in Colorado and um, bits and pieces of Utah. And so, and gotcha. Florida, a little bit of Florida. So. And so you took more breaks than just the, just the summer breaks. Yes, sir. Yeah. No, I, you know, I wanted to school is different because you, you know, a lot of college kids, they go to school and uh, they're like, Hey, I'm just going to be here. I'm going to set my roots here for four years. Um, man, I'm just going to pound it out and then I'll get out into the workforce afterward. Um, my mindset was, well, I'm going to use this opportunity because it allows you to go, uh, with internships. It allows you to go into, uh, different fields of your area or even other areas of study and, uh, you know, see if you really like it. And I think it's really important to do that and to, you know, it enabled me to see the whole country, not all of it, but most of the country in terms of, you know, how people do things because agriculture is different everywhere. You know, one thing may work here, may not work here. So, mm. and just cultures too, you know, being able to see different mm. cultures. Yeah. Um, it was big. So yeah. Different cultures as it relates to ranching. And I've, I've got a, a, a wish list that I'm hoping to, uh, to fulfill here in May of this year, which uh, by the time this comes out, be pretty, pretty quick uh, where I'd, I'd like to talk to, um, I would I would like to talk to Buck Branneman about the history of vaquero horsemanship and and stockmanship yeah. and stuff like that in that and and there's a, a documentary that uh, you can watch that where one guy describes the diff, the or they're they're contrasting the difference between stockmanship in Texas and stockmanship in California and yeah. uh, stockmanship in in California is kind of like, well, there's always tomorrow. <laughs> if we don't get it done today, there's always tomorrow. And, and stockmanship in Texas is, uh, you know, uh, I think he said, um, hurry every chance, every, hurry every time you think about it and keep it on your mind. His dad said, always mm. growing up, told him, hurry every, every chance you, th- or every time you think about it and always keep it on your mind. So it's kind of the, <laughs> the contrasting cultures, like you're saying, getting exposed to those different cultures and different ways of doing things and seeing, you know, that, there's reasons behind all of those, those differences and stuff like that. So, uh, do you have any, any specific lessons, uh, that you learned 
connected to people management in those different uh, contexts where you where you had the opportunity to intern and, and work? Um, one of them would be uh, kind of like knowing how to manage yourself, uh, kind of learn how to how to manage oneself is um, there's a great Harvard Business Review article called uh, Managing Oneself. That's a great article. Um, talks a lot about, you know, knowing yourself, how you work. Um, and then there's also some good trainings out there, you know, online trainings, like, uh, there's an insights training that's really good. Um, it allows you to, you fill out a questionnaire and it kind of tells you your, your personality and, um, um, talks about, you know, how you work well with others, you know, are you introvert, extrovert, you know, goes through pretty much your, your qualities and kind of how you are. And it, for the most part, it's pretty accurate. And uh, it was kind of eye opening for me to, to, to go through that training, um, to just kind of know myself a little bit better. You know, if you know that you're, uh, detailed oriented or, um, you know, if you're just more, you know, if I, if I need to collaborate with somebody on an idea, is it done by myself, you know, in my own mind, or is it done with other people where I can pull ideas and, you know, bounce things off of. So, um, you know, it's, it's good to know, um, yourself and, um, it's pretty common that I find myself at a continuing education seminar of some kind. And I, I think when I see those personality test, um, you know, sessions on the agenda, you know, kind of roll my eyes and say, Oh man, I wish this was a breakout session. So there was something else to go to, (laughs) but then you go and you sit through it and you're like, man, I wish everybody I ever worked with would have sat through that with me so they could understand why I tick the way I do. And I could understand why they, you know, tick the way way, the way they do. So, um, is that kind of what you're talking about in this knowing and managing yourself? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, um, I got an example. So I, I have, I have a boss that, uh, that if I have an idea or something and I want to, that something I want to do, or, um, I know, I know his personality and he knows mine. And so we've been kind of clear on how I should portray those. Right. So he's one person I'll put together a well thought out detailed plan and then present it to him, um, you know, on in writing and in person, um, instead of just like popping into an office and throwing a half baked idea at him and sit there and brainstorm with him. It's not, you know, it's not his personality to, to just sit there and bounce ideas off of it's, it's um, so th- I think it's important to know, you know, cause we all report to somebody, right. Whether it be a bank or um, you know, a manager, you know, we all report to somebody. So knowing and aligning yourself with them, um, you know, what they like and, and you know, and hope and hopes in turn that they do the same for you, you know, that they, they, uh, they can be bendable and, you know, malleable to how may, how things can be put across to you in in terms of communication or, uh, yeah. Yeah. So do you have any, any thoughts or insights, uh, with regard to, uh, I mean, I mean, that's a, that's a good one right there is, is working with the people and understanding how they want to be worked with. Uh, but do you have any, any other insights with regard to, uh, working with different personality types or different, uh, taking different approaches depending on who, who you're working with? Yeah, no, I, you know, and we can k- kind of, I like communication. I like talking about communication because I, you know, communication is key and, if there's not good, clear communication, then you can have a lot of things fall. Um, it seems like a lot of times communication can be, a, if there's ever a problem, you can usually come back to communication and either it wasn't set across right, or, you know, it wasn't um, portrayed in a way that the people understood it. So, you know, for an example, um, I could be, um, my manager can call and talk to me about uh, certain things um, you know, like, let's just say timeline events, right? So he calls and lays out the timeline events. Well, if I don't have a notepad and paper handy and I wasn't able to write them down, like I was forced back or, um, you know, where it's hard to write that down. If it's not sent to me in a text or an email, I'll probably forget a lot of it. Cause I'm, I'm a visual, uh, I need to see it in writing kind of a person. And so that's why, you know, in knowing that, and then, um, that's good for me. And then also good for uh, my manager knowing that so he can, you know, it kind of, it helps just things move a lot smoothly. Another example on that is, you know, different personality types. I, uh, I had the opportunity 
I have a cowboy that uh, worked with me that uh, was very, he liked to brainstorm. He liked to talk about it and uh, work through things. And so I had a, we were building a, a fence and I said, Hey, I need to, uh, I need the, a gate put right here in this area. Um, just use your best judgment uh, and, you know, kind of go for it. Cause I've already kind of talked with him and uh, worked with him about, we built a fence together before, but I kind of just gave him this little bit of autonomy to go out and do it himself. Um, and I just kind of gave him a general area. Well, I kind of come back a couple of days later and the gate is in a completely different area. You know, it's like in a set of trees, like, okay, well, we can't, can't really have a gate in a set of trees. Um, and it's embarrassing sharing that because, you know, we, we have, we have mess ups as managers. And, uh, so I had to kind of hang my head and go and talk to him and say, Hey, I wasn't very clear on like where I needed it. I apologize for not giving you a specific place and, uh, you know, giving you more communication on, um, what, you know, my expectations were not clear. Um, and so, you know, and we ended up moving the, the gate together and, uh, you know, work through it. And so then next time, cause you can't get mad at that. Right. Like I didn't tell him exactly where to put it. And it's not like he was defiant and went against what I said or where to put it because he thought better. It was just, he just thought that was the best place for it. And I wasn't clear in my expectations. So kind of have to eat it and, um, you know, work from there. Yeah. Is there a limit to, um, to the, the role of responsibility in, in the, life of a manager. Like, um, I appreciate you taking responsibility there. And I think that's an important thing in a lost art in a lot of cases. And I think it goes a long ways to building relational capital with employees. If we're willing to take responsibility when things aren't quite done the way we thought they should be, um, because of our lack of communication. But do you think that there's a limit, you know, how far do you take that, uh, taking of responsibility, um, just to, in full disclosure, my my tendency personally is to always assume that it was my fault, like that I could have done something more clearly or differently uh, to to help avoid this situation. So, is there is there a limit that you've you have learned as far as taking responsibility, or is it is that kind of the way you approach it too? Is always taking responsibility? Yeah, no. So uh, we can go back to books, right? Uh, so. I uh, had the opportunity to read um, kind of the principles portrayed in the book, Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willing mm-hmm. and uh, Leif, Leif Babbitt is extreme ownership, right? They're, they're, they, uh, they have an example in the book on where they're in battle and I'm hoping I'm, <laughs> I'm digging deep into the memory for this. So I'm hoping I'm uh, portraying the story correctly. Um, but there, there was a time in the book where there was a battle and during the battle, there was blue on blue there was some friendly fire and the, they were having a meeting. They were doing a brief debriefing afterwards. And, uh, you know, Jocko gets up and, or I can't remember if it's Jocko, I'm pretty sure Jocko gets up and he, you know, he asked the question, well, whose fault was it? You know, and, and, uh, kind of one by one guys start talking and saying, well, you know, if they were doing this or, you know, they weren't doing that right. And he says, no, like whose fault was this? And, they kept kind of going back and forth out in the audience. And he said, he finally asked one more time, whose fault was this? They go back and forth. And he said, it was mine, my fault that this happened. I'm in charge here. And so, you know, that story just really hit me hard. You know, you know, he took ownership of uh, some pretty not great things happening. And if he's able to do that, then I I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kind of the same way, Clay. Like I'll take it all because I own what happens, right? I'm in charge. So I own everything that happens, whether it be good or bad. And I think if you have that mindset, it, uh, because you, it's always easy to blame others. It's always easy to look out the window. You know, it's Mm. always harder to look into the mirror Mm. and say, okay, well, what did I do in that situation or what can I do better? Um, you know, so that's kind of the mindset I take. And so I don't have a limit. I, I have to take full responsibility. And so it can be hard at times when things fail, but you know, I'm not sitting around blaming other people when things fail because dang sure next time it ain't going to be like that. Like I'm not going to fail next time. I'll, and so I think it's important to kind of have that mindset. So then how do you communicate 
or w- in what forum do you communicate those those things that you'd like to see done differently and and how do you communicate them is it uh you know in the in the gate example uh was it right there when you come up to that gate and it's not where you wanted it and and the guys right there with you you're going to go through and say okay this won't work let's i i accept responsibility let's uh make a plan for moving it how did, how did you approach that yeah no i i uh I think feedback has to be given uh, frequently and often, you know, especially if you're onboarding employees um, or if, you know, things like that arise. If I were to sit on that and let's just say I, uh, I hadn't had the opportunity to see the employee for, you know, let's say we're on a ranch. We don't see them for months. Right. And I sit down and talk to him. It's been months later. He's totally forgotten about it. And I might have forgotten about it or I sat on it and let it fester. Right. Like if, if I didn't take that ownership and if I looked at it differently and I looked at, Oh, well, he, of course this gate shouldn't have gone in the trees. He's just looking to piss me off, you know, or to, you know, to do something to upset me. If you sit there and let it fester, it's just, it can turn ugly. And, uh, so I think if you nip it in the butt right there and take ownership for it and, uh, you know, and ask them, I think it's important to ask employees to, um, I had an, trying to remember the full story, but I had a, I had a cowboy, we were doing something. Um, and it just don't look right to me. What his actions just didn't look how I thought they should be. I'm trying to remember exactly what happened. Um, I want to say it's like with how a horse was getting ridden. Uh, I'm, I think that was the case. A horse was getting ridden and not a way I thought should have been, um, and I, uh, I came to him and I just said, Hey, what's going on here? And, uh, I asked, I asked the, I asked the cowboy, you know, what, what kind of was going on here? And he pretty much just talked with me through it. And, you know, after asking him, instead of just going to mm. him, just blazing angry, you know, if, but taking that step back and asking, you know, kind of what happened in that situation. Um, you know, I actually think that might be a, a fence story too. I don't <laughs> think that was a horse. <laughs> now that I now that I'm sitting here ruminating on it, but that's uh, right. yeah, it was a fence. But yeah, no, yeah, well, and I think that I think that that's an important thing. Can you can you give me some examples of ways that you've started those sentences? Um, you know, I think of can you help me understand or some of those ways? Are there other ways that you start those those sentences and those discussions to help? Uh, to help uh, foster that profitable communication rather than just the fireworks. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great uh, point. You're going to bring up another resource. Um, so there's another, a book and a training uh, crucial conversations um, by, oh man, I don't have, let's see. Uh, by Carrie Patterson, Joseph Graney, and Ron McMillan. So the, the, the training is great because it talks about, you know, what to do in those conversations that are crucial because we all run into them. We all run into these crucial conversations. And so um, they talk about and walk through, you know, start with the facts and then you ask and you kind of just stay in the facts. Don't, don't really get into the feelings, um, but just stay in the facts. And so I started with the facts. Hey, I noticed that, you know, um, I, I think the problem was with the high tensile fence. It was the wires were getting run up and over a ditch, but so the cows could walk underneath it. Right. <laughs> so, you know, common sense would tell you that's probably not the best way to run a fence. So you ask, right. So, okay. Why, why did you, why, why were we running the wires up and over the ditch and uh, you know, just kind of sticking with that. And then, you know, the wires ran over the ditch, the fact then why, why were the wires getting ran over the ditch? And, you know, so then talking with them, they, they had their reasons for uh, what they thought was best. And so, um, you know, just kind of stop, start from working through them. If they start, if you kind of start getting into the uh, emotions um, and you can kind of start to feel yourself heat up in the conversation and uh, previous training will tell you to, um, think, you know, okay, what am I feeling right now? What kind of emotion am I feeling and why am I feeling it? And it's hard to do while you're amidst the conversation. And, uh, I got to back up a little bit. It's important to, before you start the conversation to ask what you want out of it, what do I want out of this conversation? And that will kind of give you kind of a path you can go down 
on, you know, sticking with your facts and um, kind of staying detailed on it um, and then just hearing them out. And um, I, in using that approach, I've been able to get through a lot of conversations that might have heated me, um, but you have, you know, you end up coming out of it with a win win. You know, you, you both feel good about it. You were able to get your point across because you were focused on what you wanted out of the conversation. Um, and so does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, very good. I appreciate that. Do you, um, have time built into your schedule then for trainings and for, uh, these, these kinds of self-improvement, uh, sharpening that management acts? Do you have time built into your schedule where you, you can go and do that? Or do you have to carve out time, uh, personal time to make that happen? What's, what's that look like for you? So I, I, uh, I carve out personal time, uh, to do, to do some of this. Um, and you know, a lot of that's done on, um, just personally, you know, getting there, there's just a lot of great resources out there. And if I, you know, I've really taken the building myself and, uh, kind of the heart and, uh, you know, I just want to be better and better each day. Maybe it's a fault of mine, uh, but maybe it's a good thing. I'm hoping, um, just that continual improvement and it can get exhausting sometimes, but yeah, you know, but it's, it's a good way, I think, to yeah. be yourself. No, I, I think, I think you're, you're right. I think there's definitely, uh, some, or a lot of missed opportunities there where people aren't, aren't pursuing, uh, continuing education. Um, and, and I think you're, you're sharing some, some real good resources that will definitely make their way into a show notes page, uh, when we, when we get around to building that. But, uh, what, um, you mentioned the global or you mentioned the insights training and the crucial, crucial conversations, uh, training. Have those been done, uh, online or in person where, where were you able to go and, and take those courses? So those courses uh, can be done online. Yeah, they can be done online. And, uh, you asked if, you know, we can, if we, uh, I just, I don't know. I, so I was, uh, I'm going to kind of go off on another little rant here. Um, so on a magazine, uh, I was reading the other day, uh, cause another source, you know, <laughs> um, magazines is, uh, it was out of the progressive cattle magazine. So I recently, recently read an article out of there, uh, out of the March 22, uh, issue titled help wanted hiring employees during a labor shortage. And it was written by Erica Ramsey louder. And in this article, Clay, uh, she gives some pretty astounding statistics that there's been like a 52% decline in hired farm workers and a 73% decline in family farm workers since 1950. That's huge. That's massive. Um, so, you know, she also says, you know, we're struggling to recruit new employees and also struggling to retain our long-term employees. Um, and so she kind of addresses this question, you know, that we need to be better managers and better employers. Mm. Um, and so she kind of goes over compensation, like benefits, packages, wages, but toward the end of the article, she, uh, she covers company culture and, you know, those words just rang in my ears. Just, you know, I think that's huge since, since most of us in the agriculture industry are, we're kind of focused on production, you know, we're pretty, <laughs> we got to have to be, um, but we tend to get, we tend to overlook that cultural side, in my opinion, of the company, of our company culture, um, you know, uh, you know, what, what's the tone are we setting on our operation? You know, is it a place of micromanagement where, you know, in, if I'm in the employee's ear all day long, or is it kind of filled with autonomy and, and confident employees, you know, this, it could be a telltale sign if you, uh, if your business runs you or you run your business, um, you know, could you leave on vacation and come home to a ranch that's still standing or did everything crumble while you were away? Mm. You know, um, I might be opening a can of worms here, but I, I just think that there's something said about, you know, what kind of a leader you are, um, in terms of your, you know, your company and, uh, how your employees perform without you around. Um, you know, so that it could lead into a principle. I think that we could all adopt, you know, being better listeners and like, and truly caring for our employees, um, you know, being genuine, genuine with them. Um, and just showing that you care, you know, use active listening when you're talking to them. Um, you know, I, I believe it's important to, to take time about every 90 days or so, or even yearly to kind of sit down with your employees and just, just have that, give that formal time to them 
um, to where they can, you know, talk with you about what's going on, ask them questions, how they think, how you think time things are going. Um, I think when you sit down and show that you genuinely care about them and they're probably more willing to, you know, work harder for you. Uh, and you know, you have to be genuine about it. You can't just be, well, I blocked out an hour of my time to sit down with you. And so you're supposed to work harder now. <laughs> so, um, you know, you know, provide any feedback to during those times that you, you haven't been able to, um, you know, positive feedback is always great to give instead of just always giving negative, you know, um, you know, any negative things that need to be addressed, address them, nip them in the butt, get them out of the way, keep moving forward. You know, and if you got a lot of employees, write it down notes. Um, you know, if you're able to remember certain things about your employees that they don't think you might remember, it might go a long way to them to know that, you know, it shows that you care about them. Um, so, I mean, I kind of went off on a little bit of a rant. I'll get down off that soapbox now, but. No, I like it. I appreciate it. It was good. It was it was good. I appreciate it. Again, uh, I'll I'll put the a link to that article in the show notes page for today, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, people get get in there and, and click. And and uh, Logan Logan uh, Logan Pribino is is somebody that was interviewed as part of that article. So uh, anytime Logan Pribino is talking about uh, management and culture, it's it's worth. Uh, I see uh, Brocious is in there too from Maddox Cattle, Cattle Company. So uh, and those those That's two guys good. worth worth uh, worth listening to, worth paying attention to when it, when they are given a platform to to talk and 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 to speak. So um, one of the things that you said in there was active listening. Can you tell me what you meant by that and and how you practice active listening? Yeah. So active listening. So I'm not much of a talker. I don't like to talk. Um, it's it's been. Uh, uh, can be an issue for me if I let it um, just being kind of more internal. Um, so listening can come easily to me, um, but active listening and not letting my mind wander when I'm sitting down and talking to somebody and just really picking up on their, you know, really feel them, you know, put yourself in their shoes, get empathetic with them, um, you know, and, you know, really kind of see if they're going through something in life, you know, that's a great time to be there for them and help them through it. Um, I've had a, couple of uh, uh, examples of that, you know, of where, you know, I mean, I've been going through something, but my manager sat down and just like, Hey, I know you're a little off today. What's going on? You know, and just those little times just show, you know, how, how much they care and, uh, and how much they, you know, genuinely care about you. And, and uh, you know, so listening with the intent not to answer, I guess is a, uh, is how I would see it um, is active listening, you know, listen to, you know, really feel for them, how, how they, how they're perceiving things, um, and not necessarily listening. Well, how am I going to respond? Right. Trying to understand why they are feeling the way they are, uh, and trying to understand it from their perspective rather than just trying to put them into the mold that you want them in. <laughs> yes, sir. Exactly. Yeah. Good way of putting. So you, you've talked a lot about, uh, continuing education to, uh, books, magazines, uh, trainings and those kinds of things. Um, do you have any, any mechanisms or tools in place to get the most out of those? Like, especially where you're going through them, uh, on personal time, online courses, you're not in a room, you're not, uh, necessarily, having having times around the water cooler after the session where you can talk to other people and say, you know, how are you going to implement this? Do you have any, any tips or tricks for getting the most out of these continuing education uh, uh, resources that you are, um, that you're putting in your path? It's a great question. So I, I tried to take notes um, and you know, the, as great technology has allowed us, uh, there's a button on there that allows me to speak and it'll t- type for me. So um, I use that a lot, uh, especially if I'm, you know, driving a tractor that way I'm not distracted using my hands. It'll allow me to take these notes, especially when I have things kind of pop into my mind. Um, but I'm lucky enough to be kind of surrounded by uh, great people. And um, I like to surround myself with people like per- Luke Perman, where I'll call and uh, you know, we can talk and discuss uh, certain things, you know, maybe something I read out of a book the, the other day, or maybe it was a great uh, podcast I listened to. Um, but, you know, we're just, it's nice to surround yourself with people that are kind of see the world the same way as you. Um, and also, the same, you know, the world in a different way too, that could be said the other way. Um, so that you can, but if you kind of develop yourself into, you know, 
I like, uh, uh, you know, currently like collaborating with others and learning from them and pulling from their experiences. Cause that's, you know, I like to collect stories and, uh, stories are told by a lot of people and, uh, stories can tell a lot and teach us a lot. So, you know, I just say collaborating with others. Where do you see your, your career path headed or, or your, your management, uh, arc? What's the, what are some things that you're working on right now or that you're becoming aware of, uh, that a need for, uh, improvement or, or something like that? Uh, like personal improvement or just improvement in agriculture or what kind of a, I would say your management, um, what are some of the things that you're focused on right now? So kind of some of the things I'm focused on right now is, uh, recognizing people's personalities and how to mix them and how to, um, you know, blend them and how to work with them. Um, because we can be, if we put ourselves on an Island, it's pretty easy to learn how to work with ourselves. But when you start getting out there and you start working with other people, you got to, um, and ranches can be easy to get yourself on an Island. Um, and so I've been kind of working on that on how, you know, how, how do I work well with others? What things do I need to work on? Um, you know, uh, in terms of career path, I, uh, you know, working towards going into a graduate program. What's the focus of that graduate program? So I, I uh, applied and was accepted in the King Ranch Institute for Ranch Management. Um, and so I'm pretty pumped and stoked about that. It's going to be, I think it's just going to be another huge paradigm shift for me, you know, of where I can, it can really take me to the next level um, in terms of management of people, resources. Um, and so I'm, I'm very excited about that. Being able to learn from those great professors over there and uh, just the great people that are uh, involved in that program. I'm just excited to go and uh, learn from them and, a better myself continuing to better myself uh, each day. So. Sure. Yeah. And, and we've kind of talked about a couple of principles here. Um, you know, truly caring for employees by listening, uh, knowing and managing yourself. Um, is there another principle that you wanted to cover today? Yeah, I, you know, there is, if uh, we still have time, I'd like to talk about, uh, you know, time management. Yeah, no, we got time. Okay. So time management, in, in my opinion, it's pretty big. Um, so I'm going to reference another book, um, the 80, 20 principle, uh, by Richard, I want to say Richard Koch. Um, I hope I said his name, right. The, in the, the principle of the book is, you know, 80% of your work results are produced by 20% of the work effort. Um, and so as I was reading this book, it just so happened I was in, in type of a feeding season. So, you know, a lot of my time was, uh, spent feeding and um, a lot of other things could pop up and distract from that um, distract from feeding um, but what what I got out of it was is if I could focus on and you know identify these leverage points um, not just in my field but in in my day-to-day -day work and operation uh, if I could focus on these leverage points the principle tells me that if I put um, I'm going to get 80% of my results out of those 20% of things I do. So if I can focus and do those 20% of things well, then I'm going to have great results. Um, and so, you know, if I, uh, let's say I got distracted by, um, you know, focusing on cattle handling or stockmanship um, during feeding season, right? So I could do that, but if I, if I know that if I get feed to those cows in a timely manner, in a manner that um, and put most of my effort into that and making sure it's done right and uh, appropriately, then I'm going to get 8% of my results out of doing that, you know? And so it's important for us to take a step back as managers and just, you know, think about, you know, where you're spending your time, you know, list your inefficiencies um, of where you think that, you know, you're not spending your time wisely. And ident uh, identify them and work on them, you know, um, identify your leverage point points and focus on them. Gr a great CEO. I, I know he told me that he could, he could run a, he could run a huge business and a, a corporate, um, business by uh, for just three days a week or two days a week. And he says, because I focused on my leverage points, I didn't, have, you know, all that other stuff can just be kind of weed. Um, but if I just focus on harvesting, um, I'm using an analogy I didn't even think about before, but 
it might not be a good one. Um, but, you know, focusing on those, those crops that instead of cutting out all the weeds all the time, you can focus on those crops and, uh, you know, really get the most out of it. Um, and so I, I don't know. I think that's something we could all kind of think about, take a step back, think about it, um, and hope it, you know, it's helped me. I know. So yeah. I'm hoping it helps somebody else. No, it makes sense to me. Um, no, and I appreciate that. Um, so when you're, when you're looking at, um, areas in your life that need, need work, need improvement, and you, you mentioned a list, is there a way that you go about choosing which one you're going to, what you're going to work on next as you know, and, and kind of connected to that idea of the 80, 20 rule, like this one's going to be more valuable to improve on, uh, than, than another one. And I'm going to, I'm going to focus on this one, uh, in this way for the, for the time being. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so look at it from that way. Yes, yeah, sir. So I mean, when, you, when I'm hearing you talk, I hear, uh, in my, my mind, I'm kind of thinking of, uh, just self-improvement things. Uh, so if I were to list my own inefficiencies, um, and things of where I'd like to improve, you know, things come to mind of, uh, you know, spending more time with family. I like to, I really like my line of work. I love it. Um, it uh, consume. I, I let it consume a lot of my time, and maybe let my other priorities kind of fall by the wayside. Um, you know, and, and as a, I'm a young father, and um, you know, it can be get distracting sometimes with work. Um, but I know that if I can uh, kind of focus my efforts on certain things and how I spend my time uh, with my family, uh, you know, and making that time really quality time, those are some leverage points for me. Well, I think that sometimes, I think that sometimes, um, you know, if we, if, if we're not leaving work at work and we bring it home with us, then, uh, you know, we're not, we're not focused on, on the family when we're with family. Whereas if we can figure out a way to make sure that we're taking care of work while we're at work so that when we come home, we can leave it there. I think that's, uh, you know, kind of, kind of what I hear you talking about. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way of putting it, Clay. It's 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 important because. You know, I could be, we could all be the best managers and best cowboys in the world, but if you don't have nothing to come home to, um, or, you know, if, if things that you care most about aren't there for you, you know, when you're done with work, then, um, you know, and if it's work for you, then that's great. You know, I, uh, but for me personally, my family is important to me. And so, uh, you know, focusing on how I can, uh, better use my time and when I'm with them, is, uh, it really, it helps me in work because I am able to, you know, feel good about how I left home or how I, you know, how I'll be coming home. And so, uh, you know, I'm able to focus on work when I'm at work. And it's, it's just, it all kind of balances itself. Yeah, definitely. No, appreciate it. Very, very good. Very practical, very helpful uh, stuff. I'm, I appreciate your time today. Um, do you have any, any other, uh, anything else on the list or things that you were hoping to, to cover today that uh, you wanted to, uh, to share uh you know clay i think i could get you know we can get pretty deep into a lot of this stuff or a lot into um you know i could just list books for days and you know magazine articles and you know i think it's just the, the principles that if we focus on those um i think it's just you know if you're continually wanting to better yourself be a better manager and employer or an employee uh for that matter um and you know and knowing managing yourself and managing your time wisely. Um, yeah, no, I can, we could go on forever, but books are great. Um, and I can't really say I read a lot of books because I mostly listen to all my books. So I can't be one of mm-hmm. those guys, uh, that says I read a lot of books. So, um, but you know, it all just kind of helps shape us and how we think about ourselves and in the scheme of things, you know, whether or not we're a cowboy or, um, if we're the CEO of a company. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't think, I think leaders are readers, you know, that's been a, in a kind of a mantra for a long time in the, in the leadership world and lots of different people have said it and I don't know who said it first, but leaders are readers. And I, I think it's an important, an important thing that uh, probably gets overlooked quite a bit. Uh, you, you mentioned that you listen to most of your books. Is that audible? And then kind of, uh, throughout your day, you're listening to books or how, do you, do you set aside time to be able to focus on, uh, on a book uh, during uh, a certain time of the day or how do you, how are you approaching the actual uh, 
taking in of those resources? Yes, sir. So um, I use Audible and I also use, um, are you talking about Audible, the app, or are you talking about yeah. like, yeah, yeah, so I use Audible, the app. Um, there's another great one, Libby. Uh, Libby, if you got a library card, um, you can hmm. pull for it. Like, it's, it's great. You go in there and it just works with your library. Um, and so it's all it is, is it's the library system of all their audiobooks. Wow. So I find a lot of them on Libby. Um, and if you, if you've moved around and got different library cards, it'll work with through all those libraries. So it's, it's great. Um, you know, and you, if you got a library card, you can use that. And so I, I usually listen to them. Um, so t- in talking about using my time wisely by being home, that's why I usually listen to books is because I have a lot of time either in a tractor or truck. Um, that I can listen to and uh, uh, listen to books that way. Whereas when I come home, I don't have a lot of time to just sit down and read a book, you know? So um, in listening to those uh, audios and podcasts, uh, you know, it enables me to take in that information throughout the day and not let me fall into a music, uh, <laughs> uh, fall into music. It just seems like when I listen to music, I just, time just flies by. Which is probably good mm-hmm. sometimes, but you know, I, I just don't feel like it's the best use of my time where I can be uh, learning, can you know, learning new things. Um, you know, I like to just learn because you know we we don't take much out of this life with us, um, but what we learn here. So you know, I think it's just, yeah. I think it's just good to always learn. You got anything else to say about uh, creating a positive culture? I really appreciated, you know, the the checking in with employees. Um, but do you have anything else to say as far as uh, positive culture goes? Do you guys get together um, apart from uh, performance reviews and and as the ran- in the ranching for profit world they would say the the uh, Whatby meetings, uh, uh, Whitby meetings? Do you, do you get together outside of those kind of contexts where you're uh, just getting together to enjoy, uh, you know, good food and cold drinks and, and spend some time together. Or you guys do anything like that to kind of foster a positive culture within the, the people that you're working with? Yeah. You know, I, I think I have the opportunity to work with uh, the guys pretty closely on a day to day basis. So, um, you know, doing the day to day stuff, you know, and just always being there, um, you know, and, and it's hard sometimes because you get, you want to get busy and you want to get things done. Um, but I feel, I try to, um, I set aside time to plan on Fridays, um, Friday afternoons. And so that's time that we can use to sit down and talk. And so, you know, it's kind of a weekly, it's not formal at all. And I don't think the, those other meetings I talked about earlier need to be formal. Um, but, uh, you know, sitting down and just hearing them out and, usually we find ourselves talking about things that aren't, you know, work related, which is good. Um, you know, and just building those relationships. Um, cause I, I, uh, yeah, you no, know, just building those relationships. And I, uh, yeah, we talk about onboarding employees. Um, you know, it's, it's, in, it's important. Those first little bit, uh, mm. first three days or so it's important, uh, to retain for retaining and, uh, kind of keeping that engaged employee. You know, and uh, with day to day, you know, when you're teaching a new employee about the operation or um, how you do things, you know, teach with detail, uh, kind of really set them up to think for themselves and kind of get them in your mindset, kind of help them align to you instead of being mysterious and, um, you know, kind of just help them kind of align with yourself so they can be aligned, you know, and and then those one-on-one times, I think it's important, you know, whether you're moving between pastures or, or at the end of a week during a planning session, you know, just, uh, it, it will just provide dividends as time goes on. It will, mm-hmm. it, it pays off. And I've, I've seen it work for me multiple times. So is part of that onboarding process, hiring the right people yeah. or is it? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> help me think about that. What are, what are some of the things you're doing as far as hiring people well, um, that, that are helpful or paying dividends later on? Like you said, um, that makes me think back to, uh, talk, I, I want to say good to great. I want to say good to great. Um, but yep. they talk about yep. having the right people on the bus, if mm-hmm. I remember correctly. And yep. so, you know, you got to have the right people on the bus. If you don't have the right people on the bus. It doesn't matter where you're driving, you know? <laughs> um, <and> so, <laughs> so, you know, having the right people, it's important. 
working through those kind of working through how they work. Um, you know, the first 90 days, you're going to really kind of see uh, kind of what they're about and you're probably going to see a full cycle because they might be on their best behavior that first couple of weeks or so. Um, but you're probably going to start seeing them, especially if you're in a busy time like calving season or feeding season, you know, and so, um, I, you know, just kind of being aware. So that's, that's where, uh, areas that I'd like to, you know, focus and learn more on is, uh, um, hiring the right employees, how to, how to pick up those, uh, things that, you know, mean most to you and how picking up personalities that work best with you and how to, uh, you know, onboard those onto your ranch or operation, um, I think would be important, um, to at least identify them so you're aware of them. Right. And so that's something that you, you don't feel like you've kind of got your, your hands around yet. You're still working on hiring the right people Yes, sir. right now. The, the tactic is just recognizing this is the seat on the bus that this person should be in yeah. uh, because that's the, where they're going to add the most value to our, our operation. Yes, sir. Yep. No, that's, that's a, uh, that's exactly said, right. You know, I, I just haven't had that opportunity to get my feet wet in that. And so, right. uh, you know, to, uh, to learn more on that, I'm, I'm hoping right. to continue to move in that area. Yeah. And I think that that probably represents most people, uh, most people, especially in ranching, it's family. <laughs> and so yeah. sometimes it's hard to fire family. <laughs> uh, it's always hard to fire family, but, uh, because it's always hard, it almost never gets done. Right. And exactly. so it's better to figure out how to put them in the right seat so that they add the most value than it is to try to, to try to, you know, you don't really have the option to, to get the right person on the bus. So you can just figure out these are the people we've got. Here's the seats that they should be in, that they will add the most value if they're in those seats. Yes, sir. Yeah. And you know, yeah. yep, I agree. Very good. Well, I, I appreciate your time today. Um, have, have we missed anything or anything else that you're really hoping to cover? When you're providing feedback, I think it's important. Um, I'm just thinking back to what I was talking about uh, when you're providing feedback, uh, you know, don't always, I think I might already said it, but when you provide the feedback, you know, don't, don't have that feedback be in the bullpen. You know, when you're down, mm. you know, I've been in that situation before where, you know, you're in the midst of something and, um, figuratively or metaphorically be in the bullpen, you know, the, you know, your employees in the fire and you're trying to provide them feedback and they get upset or, you know, they can't, they can't hear you or, you know, so, um, if things don't go how you want them to in certain situations, uh, I think it's important to sit down afterward. And even when things go good, I think um, I've kind of taken it on to, you know, let's say after we have a marketing branding or we have a, you know, we after a day of shipping or uh, just a day of feeding, if we sit down and talk about the day, you know, what, thing, what things went great and what things didn't go so great. And, uh, you know, what could we do to be better? How, you know, what could we do better to work as a team? Um, you know, and get their feedback as well. You know, instead of just sitting down and lecturing them on, uh, you know, what they did wrong all day. <laughs> um, so, yep. you know, and so just providing that feedback. And I've already said it, you know, often. Um, and then positive feedback too. You know, but only give cre- uh, credit what credit is due as well. You know, we don't want to just right. be always puffing them up, and and then one day they're doing something bad, and you say, well, you're not doing such a great job now. You know. <laughs> So I think it's right. to be consistent with them. Um, I think that kind of a lot of what we've talked about today um, is that we need to have a space built into our businesses where we can get across the table from the people we're working with and either pitch ideas like you talked about originally with your boss. You're pitching ideas, you know, in a detailed way, in a well thought out way. Um, you know, you're making a proposal. Um for the business, um, also performance reviews, uh, not not in the bullpen like you just said, uh, but taking time in a specific uh, and during a specific set set aside time and saying, let me you know understand where you're coming from. Let's talk about how you're doing. Um, let's talk about what you're doing well. Let's talk about what could be better. Um, you know, but I think it's so much of and, and I've done it too, and I've shared the story many times about. Uh, wanting to buy some a specific set of cows out of my dad's herd and um you know but always pitching that idea while we were horseback sorting out cows uh rather than um sitting down uh, you know around the around the table and and writing out a proposal and sliding it across the table to him and saying these are the cows I want 
um, and this is when I'd like to buy them, and this is what I'd like to pay you for them, because uh, the fact that I just pitched them over and over again while we're sorting cows, it ended up that they those cows all got sold, and it was to somebody other than me. Sure. But it was totally my fault for not taking the time to, you know, outside of the daily work environment to sit down and say, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I'd like to, to do. Um, yeah, so I think that the, just having that space where we can actually make proposals and and review uh, a job well done or or a job that could have been done better is a is a really important uh, piece to successful ranch management. Yes, sir. Yeah, and even you know setting yourself up for success to you know how you would with cattle handling, you want to set your cows up to succeed, um, and so you know you want to set your employees up to succeed as well. Um, and even if you are looking to get something, uh, let's say a proposal done. You know, have that be your proposal, go into that knowing that it's a very good high probability that they're going to say yes to. Because, you you know, in knowing your manager, knowing, you know, who you report to, uh, you don't want to walk in there all the time with these, um, you know, it may, it may be a well detailed, thought out plan. But if you already know they're going to say no, then why invest that capital? Why, why go there and use up that little bit of um, uh, that, you know, you don't want to use up that ground there. You know, you want, you want to go into it. You want to get more yeses than no's. So, you know, make sure it's something that you, you know, has a pretty high probability in knowing them and, um, you know, and so you can get, yeah. get more out of it, I guess. No, no, that's, that's a real, that's good. Very good. Really appreciate that. Uh, Sam, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for, for taking the time to share some of what you got, what you've learned over the years. Yes, sir. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate you having me, Clay. I'm still young and uh, still learning, so uh, I, I'm adapting. So it's been fun <laughs> talking with you and just conversating. So. Really appreciate uh, that list of resources. Um, really appreciate Sam and, and what he has had to to share with us there. Um, very good uh, perspective and, and very helpful and list of resources. So yeah, make sure you check out the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 248. All that will be linked in the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 248. Uh, coming up next week on the show, Lord willing, I think we're going to head in the back in the direction of Bart Carmichael for episode 249. Um, and we're going to talk to him about balance in our ecosystem or in the in our in our environment and how how do we uh, pay attention to the way things uh, are are designed from my perspective God uh, was a wise master builder and uh, he put things together in a way that they all work in concert in unity uh, and sometimes what we have to do is is step back from the things that annoy us and and maybe the things that are pushing back to back against us from nature's perspective and allow them to do uh, the work that they were designed to do. And so I uh, uh, had a real good conversation with Bart about that. And I said, hey, we should make that an episode. So hopefully uh, we can get to get together with that in the next week and, and put that together for episode 249 of the Working Cows podcast. And as I've done in the past, uh, I've tried to uh, make some special milestone kind of episodes for uh, the the big numbers uh in the Working Cows podcast, and um, they've been falling on July, which is a busy month for us. So you've maybe noticed some interruptions in the release schedule over the years uh, when it comes to July. Um, got a really neat uh, camp that here, where the the church that I pastor, uh, the people of the of the church, uh, run a really neat camp that's been operating uh, here for quite a while. And so, uh, just that's a heads up. That uh, might be an interruption in the release schedule, but Lord willing, episode 250 is going to be a pretty special one. Uh, had an idea planted in my head a, a while back by Steve Campbell, and um, I'm giving it my best to see that uh, idea come to fruition. And I think it'll be a pretty unique, unique uh, opportunity to uh, hear hear some advice for the next generation. So. Uh, that's that's about all I'm going to say about that for now. Uh, hopefully, Lord willing, it will release uh, July 18th. We'll see if that happens. But uh, that's that's the scheduled release date for that coming up uh, for episode 250. But before that, we're going to hopefully talk to Bart Carmichael about um, allowing allowing the uh, nature 
<laughs> to do its work, allowing God's design to play out in our ranching operations and understanding all the different roles that things play, like even bus, uh, beavers and muskrats and mosquitoes and uh, l- letting them do the work that they uh, were designed to do, even though uh, sometimes if we're fighting against nature, uh, they can seem like an enemy. So uh, for all all of that and more, hopefully next week, episode 249 coming your way real soon. Uh, on the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.